Romans chapter 15. We'll be reading verse 20 this morning. Romans chapter 15, and verse 20. Paul writes, Yea, so have I strived to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, lest I should build upon another man's foundation. Title of the message this morning, there's no doubt about it. If you look at the facts, let's pray. Father, we need you this morning. Pray that you would work in our hearts, work in our midst. You know every life, you know every need. I pray that you'd meet needs this morning. I pray you'd open blinded eyes that have never seen the light of the gospel. Perhaps they trust in religion, they trust in their own good works. I pray that they would understand their need to trust in you this morning. Guide as your word goes forth, in Jesus' name, amen. As we saw last week and as we see in our text this morning, Paul was a pioneer, a trailblazer with the gospel message. He was going where no gospel preacher had gone before. And so he writes, Yea, so have I strived to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, lest I should build upon another man's foundation. Because of that, he was prepared to give the evidence for the trustworthiness of that gospel message. He would write to the church at Philippi, even as it is meet for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, inasmuch as both in my bonds and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, ye all are partakers of my grace. And the defense and the confirmation of the gospel, verse 17, he said, I'm set for the defense of the gospel. As we said last week, God never requires blind faith. God gives overwhelming proof, overwhelming evidence for the trustworthiness of the Word of God, the existence of Himself, and the gospel message. There's an abundance of evidence for the existence of God and for the gospel message and for the inspiration of the Bible. And for sake of time, we're only concerning ourselves with one area, the divine inspiration of the Bible. That is, that this book that we hold in our hands this morning is literally the Word of God, the very words of God. I'm not asking you to take my word for it this morning. I'm asking you to examine the evidence because there's an abundance of evidence. There are thousands of books and pamphlets and various manuscripts claiming to be from God, claiming to be the words of God. How, how do we sort through all of that? How can we be convinced that what we have this morning is the truth? There, there are a lot of different religions and groups out there that are claiming they have the truth, claiming that their book or books are inspired. How do we know for sure that the Bible, and only the Bible, is the Word of God? Actually, it's not that complicated, and it's not that difficult. And it's not something where at the end of the day you say, well, I, I guess the Bible has a lot going for it. I, I, maybe it looks like it might be inspired by God. No. The evidence is substantial. The evidence is irrefutable. We're looking at primarily the scientific evidence in the Bible that demonstrates that God is the only one who could have authored the Bible. Of course, He used human instruments. He gave them the words to write. We looked last week at the fact that the stars are uncountable. You might say this morning, well, yeah, I know that. Everybody knows that. But for most of human history, they didn't know that. They had no idea. It wasn't until the invention of the telescope in the 17th century that they found that out. Now, if people would have paid closer attention to the Bible, then they would have known. The Bible actually has quite a bit to say about the heavens, the stars, and the universe. Psalm 19 says, the heavens declare the glory of God. We sang this morning, how great thou art. The heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament showeth His handiwork. Day unto day utter a speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Sometimes people wonder why God made the universe so big. Some eight or nine times the Bible says that God stretched out the heavens. And there are a lot of amazing things to discover out there. And as we keep studying and looking, we find more and more amazing things. 
Proverbs 25, 2 says, It is the glory of God to conceal a thing, but the honor of kings is to search out a matter. And there are a lot of things to be found out. Psalm 89, 5, The heavens shall praise thy wonders, O Lord. Psalm 92, 5, O Lord, how great are thy works, and thy thoughts are very deep. A brutish man knoweth not. Neither doth a fool understand this. We've talked before. When the Bible calls someone brutish, it means they're like an animal. Uh, your dog doesn't sit around and think about the existence of God. Your cat certainly doesn't think about that. <laughs> why, why? They're brutish. They're brutish. And so the brutish man doesn't consider the glories of God, the wonders of God, by looking at the wonders and glories of creation. Psalm 97, 6, the heavens declare His righteousness. And all the people see his glory. Isaiah 40, verse 5, the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. Psalm 33, 6, by the word of the Lord were the heavens made and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spake and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. As we study the stars, there are some logical conclusions that we should draw and some lessons we should learn. The psalmist would say, when I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? Isaiah 40, verse 26, Lift up your eyes on high, and behold, who hath created these things, that bringeth out their host by number? He calleth them all by names, by the greatness of his might, for that he is strong in power. Not, <clears throat> excuse me, not one faileth. We talked last week about the name a star after someone for thirty-nine ninety-five or whatever they charge, but actually all the stars are already named. They're already named. And Psalm 147, 4 says, He telleth the number of the stars. He calleth them all by their names. And so these stars that are too many for us to count, God's named them all. He created them all. He created everything, all of the world, the universe, everything that's within it. He would say, every beast of the forest is mine, and the cattle upon a thousand hills. I know all the fowls of the mountains, the wild beasts of the field are mine. Jeremiah 10, 12 says, He hath made the earth by His power. He hath established the world by His wisdom, and hath stretched out the heavens by his discretion. There are so many stars out there that all we can do is make educated guesses that are still wildly speculative. They tell us that a dime held at arm's length, a dime. If you had infinite vision and you could see for as far as, as our telescopes can go, a dime held at arm's length would block at least 15 million stars from view. There are a lot of stars out there. The most brilliant minds over the course of thousands of years had no idea that this was true. As we said before, in our galaxy alone, there's some 200 to 500 billion stars. Again, they don't know. And uh, there are 200 to 300, 400 billion galaxies out there. They really don't know. They just can make wild guesses. As recently as 400 years ago, the man most qualified to weigh in on the subject of the number of the stars was a man by the name of Johannes Kepler. He's known as the founder, the father of modern astronomy. He was a math teacher at the university level. He was the imperial royal mathematician of Emperor Rudolf II, the, the head of Hungary and Croatia, Bohemia and Austria. He was also the royal official mathematician to Rudolph's next two successors in line. He was called a pioneer in the field of optics, specializing in seeing and in light. Was there anyone more qualified to tell us how many stars there are? He, he was an astronomer par excellence. He was a mathematical genius and presumably good at counting. He was a trailblazing pioneer in optics, presumably good at seeing things. So somewhere around the turn of the century, 17th century, this brilliant, highly educated man told the world that there are a total of 1,055 stars. <laughs> Approximately 2,195 years before Kepler made that pronouncement, 
an untrained prophet in the fields of astronomy and science and optics, an untrained prophet by the name of Jeremiah, said that there were too many stars to count. In fact, he likened the number of stars to the number of grains of sand on all of the seashores. Imagine how big that number is. And he likened the two together to say, in essence, that we cannot count or measure either one. Approximately 3,477 years before Kepler... Moses recorded the angel of the Lord, likewise using the stars and the sand to illustrate numbers too big to count, long before Kepler came on the scene. The Bible doesn't set out to be, or claim to be, a book of astronomy or a scientific textbook, but every place it talks about science, it is 100% accurate. A hundred percent accurate and oftentimes thousands of years ahead of its time. Do you realize that science textbooks from five years ago, ten years ago, fifteen years ago become obsolete very quickly? In five years, ten years. And they're written by trained scientists that do nothing but write science textbooks, many of them. And yet five years later they have to be revised and changed and corrected and updated because they have things that we now know to be untrue. The Bible written thousands of years ago by people with no training in science, and yet it is 100% accurate. There's only one way to account for it. God wrote it. Now, there are plenty more scientific facts to consider. Secondly, the earth is suspended in space. Copernicus discovered this in 1543. The Greeks used to think it was on the shoulders of Atlas. The Hindus used to think it was on the backs of elephants. When they would shake, they would get earthquakes. And uh, Mesopotamians thought the earth was like a floating boat, was on on some kind of sea. The, The Egyptians believed that it rested on five great pillars. Job 26, 7 says, He stretcheth out the north over the empty place and hangeth the earth upon nothing. Upon nothing. Thousands of years before these supposed intellectuals gave us all of their Various theories about what the earth rested upon. God's word says, no, it it rests upon nothing. He hangs the earth upon nothing. It talks about stretching out the north over the empty place. After Lord Rossi invented his giant telescope so powerful that newspaper print could be read 20 miles away, it was discovered that in the northern part of the heavens there was a great empty space without a single solitary star in one big section. And in all the other parts there were... There were very few in the north, north part. Astronomy article titled, What's 250 Million Light Years Big, Almost Empty, and Full of Answers? They call it the Boötes Void because of the vast stretches of emptiness. It has only about 1% of the stars that should be there as compared to the other regions of the universe. How would Job have known about that? Approximately 37, 3,800 years before scientists and astronomers with high-powered telescopes discovered it. God told him. We actually didn't learn about all of that until Robert Kirshner discovered the Boetus Void in 1981. 1981. Why did it take so long to discover? Because of the vastness of the universe, it plays havoc with our depth perception. Even looking through uh, highly advanced telescopes, galaxies in the foreground and in the background obscured it from view. And it was with precise modern instruments that astronomers were finally able to discover, quote unquote, what Job had told us all along that there's a great empty space in the north. The earth hanging in space, Copernicus in AD 1543 made the bold statement that the earth is round and it hangs in space. It was through discoveries by Copernicus and Sir Isaac Newton that formed the modern basis of our concepts of outer space. And yet Job had been told in his day thousands of years before, thousands of years before science discovered it, that the earth is suspended in space. It hangs upon nothing. Thirdly, we know know that the earth is not flat. Most of us, most of the world, there is a a society out there if you want to join them, but... uh, they're a little different. Um, but Isaiah 40, 22 says, It is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth. 
the circle of the earth. And the inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers, that stretcheth out the heavens as a curtain, and spreadeth them out as a tent to dwell in. Isaiah wrote this around 700 B.C. Yet it was only when Magellan's expedition sailed around the world in A.D. 1475 that it was generally finally accepted that the earth was round. Christopher Columbus wrote in his diary in reference to his discovery of the new world in 1492, it was the Lord who put it into my mind. I could feel His hand upon me. There is no question the inspiration was from the Holy Spirit because He comforted me with rays of marvelous illumination from the Holy Scriptures. Number four, we now know scientifically, we now know that blood is the source of life for flesh. William Harvey was the first to discover that in 1628. Physicians used to practice bloodletting to try to rid the body of poisons. In fact, long after he discovered it, they still did it for many, many years. Leviticus 17.11, for the life of the flesh is in the blood. And I've given to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the souls. The life of the flesh is in the blood. William Harvey was an English physician and an anatomist, and he anatomist, and he was the first person to discover how, how blood circulates in the body. Perhaps the single most important discovery in the science of physiology. Now known as a basic scientific truth, you can learn about it in second grade, but people didn't know for a long time. Harvey published the results of his study in 1628 in a little book called An Anatomical Treatise on the Movement of the Heart and Blood in Animals. Because our understanding of the causes of diseases and their, their spread depends on, really in large part many times, the understanding of the circulation of the blood. Harvey's discovery has been put on the par by historians of medicine with Newton's discovery of gravity. It was that life-changing, that earth-shaking, if you will. God had revealed the same truth to Moses thousands of years before Harvey rediscovered it, if you will. George Washington died sometime between 10 and 11 p.m., Saturday, December 14th, 1799. He had a sore throat. That's what started everything. At daybreak on the 14th, George Rawlins bled him, one half pint of blood. George Washington weighed 174 pounds. He would have had approximately 11 pints of blood in his body based on his weight and based on his gender. A person can lose about a pint of blood and not be in any real danger. If a person loses two pints of blood, the body starts to exhibit signs of shock. George Washington was only 67 years old, had led an active life, and was seemingly in very good health, very active physically, no sign of any ill health. Before his death, he had ridden around his Mount Vernon estate on a cold, miserable, snowy day. He decided to stay in his wet clothes upon completing his ride so as to not be late for dinner. It's important to a man. <laughs> that night he woke his wife Martha up to say that he wasn't feeling well. So George summons, George Rollins was summoned to bleed him at daybreak. At 9 a.m., Dr. James Craig showed up and he bled him some more. A Dr. Gustavus Brown showed up. He bled him some more. And then he was bled again. The fourth and final time, they drew out 32 ounces of blood. And then, mysteriously, shockingly, George Washington died. They had taken about four and a half pints of blood. They'd taken about 40% of his blood. And then he died. Almost 3,300 years before this tragedy, God had inspired Moses to write, the life of the flesh is in the blood. It's in the blood. The Bible's inspired by God. Isostasy, the study of the balance of the earth. This came into full understanding by scientists in 1959, not that long ago. We now know that the earth is weighted and it's balanced and all the components, the chemical components that make it up are weighted and balanced. Isaiah 40, verse 12, Who hath measured the waters in the hollow of his hand, and meted out heaven with the span, and comprehended the dust of the earth in a measure, and weighed the mountains in scales, and the hills in a balance? Who hath directed the Spirit of the Lord, or being his counselor hath taught him? 
We didn't even know all those things were necessary, but now we understand they are. And so Isaiah's asking, where did the Lord learn all this? How could he know to do all of this and, and get it right the first time? With whom took he counsel and who instructed him and taught him in the path of judgment and taught him knowledge and showed to him the way of understanding? It's only been in recent years that chemists discovered that all substances to combine chemically must be weighed or measured. And this is called isostatic balance or equilibrium. For example, table salt is designated NaCl, Na for sodium, Cl for chlorine gas, and only in exact proportions with sodium and chlorine gas combined. Water is H2O, two parts hydrogen, one part oxygen. For those, those have to combine together in exact proportions, we get water. And so the ingredients of each substance can only be combined as they're weighed out or measured, if you will, in certain exact proportions. And Isaiah expressed this great truth somewhere around 700 B.C., long before scientists had discovered this. And God weighed and measured and balanced the ingredients of every substance he created. He balanced all the ingredients that make up the earth. He balanced the earth itself. Again, only in the last few decades have we come to understand this and to understand how important and necessary it is. Scientific truth number six, currents exist in the oceans. Again, it's one of those things, well, everybody knows that, but they didn't. Matthew Fontaine Maury published his findings in 1855 that currents exist in the ocean. It was revolutionary. It changed a lot of things. He was an American naval officer. He was an oceanographer. He lived from 1806 to 1873. But he was also a Christian. And he loved reading his Bible. And he also had no doubts about its accuracy. And these facts led him to some remarkable discoveries in science. Maury entered the U.S. Navy in 1825, but an accident in 1839 partially disabled him, so he left active sea duty. Three years later, while still with the Navy, he was appointed superintendent of the U.S. Naval Observatory in Washington, and he was also of the U.S. Depot of Charts and Instruments. And so over the next 19 years, Matthew Fontaine Maury would devote himself to studying the winds and the clouds, and the weather, and the ocean features, as well as the Bible. And the words of Psalm 8 stuck in his mind, whatsoever passeth through the paths of the sea. And so Maury determined that if God's Word said there were paths in the sea, then, then there must be paths. There must be paths in the sea. And, and so he set out to find them. He began to study old ship's logs, and from these, he compiled charts of ocean wind and, and, and sea currents. And to study the speed and the direction of the sea currents, Maury began to set, a, set adrift an, an, a huge number of what were called drift bottles. These, these floated slightly below the surface of the water, so they were not affected at all by the wind. And he, he just turned all those bottles loose. And inside each of those bottles was a, kind of a little detailed description of what he was doing and asking whoever found the bottle to record where they found it, when they found it, send him back the information. So this took many years to complete this study. And so from the location and the date on which the bottles were found, Maury was able to develop his charts of the ocean currents, the paths of the sea, which greatly, greatly increased uh, uh, the knowledge and the speed of sea navigation. In 1855, Maury wrote the first textbook on modern oceanography, the physical geography of the sea and its meteorology. And, and in this work, Maury presented oceanography from a delightfully Christian view. He included biblical passages of meteorological and other scientific importance, such as the scripture quote from the book of Job, which refers to God's making the weight for the winds. And he explained the biblical statement this way in his book, though the fact that the air has weight here is so distantly announced in Job, philosophers never recognized the fact until within comparatively a recent period. And then it was proclaimed by them as a great discovery. Nevertheless, the fact was set forth as distinctly in the book of nature as it is in the book of Revelation. And so Maury, from all of this study, subsequently prepared charts of the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean between the United States and Europe, which showed the practicability of laying undersea cables. He died in 1873. He was elected to the Hall of Fame for great Americans. 
A monument erected in his honor on Monument Avenue in Richmond, Virginia, reads Matthew Fontaine Maury, Pathfinder of the Seas, the genius who first snatched from the oceans and atmosphere the secret of their laws, his inspiration, Holy Writ, Psalm 8, 8, and Ecclesiastes 1, 6. Now, it's often claimed that the Bible is not a scientific textbook, and indeed it is not. Yet the Bible's accuracy when touching on scientific se- subjects has led a great many scientists to some outstanding discoveries because it's 100% accurate. Psalm Isaiah 43, 16, Thus saith the Lord, which maketh a way in the sea and a path in the mighty waters. You see, it used to be when a ship would just set sail from America to Europe or Europe to America or other spots, they would just go in a straight path. Well, oftentimes the currents are against you. The paths of the sea are against you and greatly delays the journey. It's just like if you fly in a plane. If, you, if you're one of those that sits there and watches the plane as it goes, you know, they give you that little map. Uh, you're never flying in a straight line. You're flying up or below. They're, they're trying to catch the tailwinds. They want to go. And, and so two flights are never exactly the same. I think the last time I flew, we had like 350-mile tailwinds or something like that. That greatly helps the plane. Uh, helps the gas mileage. You don't want to be flying against that. And so same thing with the ocean. There's, there's these paths, and once he charted these out, and they, it's a regular uh, current, once he charted them out, it, it became much, much quicker to go across the ocean. Psalm 8.8, 8, the fowl of the air, the fish of the sea, whatsoever passeth through the paths of the seas. And so Maury said, if God wrote it, it must be true, must be a scientific truth, And so he has been called the father of oceanography. Truth number seven, the existence of global wind patterns. uh, Satellites help this scientific field to really come into uh, maturity and understanding in the 1960s. This is a recent discovery. Ecclesiastes 1 6 says, The wind goeth toward the south and turneth about unto the north. It whirleth about continually, and the wind returneth again according to his circuits. Now, Solomon had no satellites. He had no modern technology. In the 17th century, Galileo discovered that the wind had circuits. In 1630, he discovered that what the Bible says is true. It wasn't until Galileo's time that man discovered that the wind had regular circuits. And our winds are due to the earth's rotation and the sun's radiation on various surfaces of the earth. And added to Galileo's discovery, it was found in the mid-1880s, that, uh, or the mid-1800s, excuse me, that the circulating winds of the northern hemisphere deflect to the right and those of the southern hemisphere deflect to the left, which shows a regular uh, pole to equator circulation. And how wise Solomon was when he mentioned this great scientific truth about 935 B.C., you can pick up a copy of the Farmer's Almanac, and it's going to tell you basically what the weather's going to be like. Now, it's not precise. It's more general, but it can tell you what the weather's going to be like. How could they tell that? They wrote this a long time ago because there's the regular wind patterns. And if you live here, and all of a sudden the, the, uh, in the springtime, and all of a sudden you get a really warm day, and people say, oh, the Santa Anas are blowing. Well, that's a regular occurrence, and it brings warm air. And so uh, the Bible talks about all that. Scientific truth number eight, the springs of the sea. We now know that there are literally springs, freshwater springs in many parts of the sea. Job 38, 16, has thou entered into the springs of the sea. Genesis 7, 11, in the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, the same day where all the fountains of the great deep broken up and the windows of heaven were opened. Now the ocean is very deep. Almost all of the ocean floor is in total darkness. And, and the pressure there is, is tremendous. It's enormous. It would have been impossible for Job to have entered into and explored the springs of the sea. Until very recently, it was thought that the oceans were fed only by rivers and rain. And yet in the 1970s, with the help of deep diving research submarines that were constructed to withstand 6,000 pounds per square inch pressure, oceanographers discovered that there are springs on the ocean floor. Literally freshwater springs that flow up through the ocean floor. How would Job have known about that? He wouldn't have, except God told him. God told him. Number nine, laughter and cheerfulness have positive health benefits. We are just now beginning to understand this in the last few decades. Proverbs 17, 22, a merry heart doeth good like a medicine, but a broken spirit dryeth the bones. Mary Hart doeth good like a medicine. They didn't always know that. 
They would have if they'd read the Bible. Here's an article from back in 2003, Reader's Digest. Using humor to ease pain and help healing is no laughing matter to a growing number of doctors. This is in 2003. A growing number of doctors have caught on to this. Yet thousands of years before, God's Word is said of Mary Hart, doeth good like a medicine. A growing number of doctors, nurses, and healthcare workers. We all know that it feels great to engage in a good laugh, but a small yet significant body of research suggests that the ability to see life from the lighter side may be medicinal. Studies have hinted that humor can alleviate allergy symptoms, increase pain tolerance, bolster the disease-fighting immune system, reduce the risk of stroke and heart attack, and even help diabetics control their blood sugar. The idea that laughter can be therapeutic certainly isn't a novel one. The Bible says a merry heart doeth good like a medicine. Yet modern medicine's interest in the link between humor and health can be largely traced to a different book, Norman Cousins' 1979 bestseller, Anatomy of an Illness. So in other words, they say, yeah, it's in the Bible, but medicine woke up to this reality when Norman Cousins published his book in 1979. Now, Cousins was a longtime editor of the Saturday Review, and he, he battled a painful and crippling arthritic disease called ankylosing spondylitis. Faced with a poor prognosis, Cousins decided to just ditch his drug regimen. It wasn't working for him in favor of large doses of vitamin C and even larger doses of humor. That's how he decided to treat his own illness. He had a movie projector moved into his hospital room where he'd watch candy camera episodes and Marx Brothers films. A nurse read him humor books. He said, I made the joyous discovery that 10 minutes of genuine belly laughter had an anesthetic effect and would give me at least two hours of pain-free sleep. That's what he wrote in his book. And doctors begin to take notice. Gradually, the pain went away. He became more mobile. He did what doctors didn't expect. He got better. So research studies followed in the book's wake and continue today. And a lot of them support the notion that humor does a body good in various ways. Researchers at the University of Texas followed 2,478 people ages 65 and older for six years. They found that subjects who scored high on a happiness questionnaire had a much lower risk of stroke than their down-in-the-dumps counterparts. The happier folks were, the more protective the effect seemed to be. Japanese researchers announced that a little laughter around the dinner table might help people with type 2 diabetes the most common form of the disease. Subjects in the small study published in the journal Diabetes Care had less of a spike in post-meal blood sugar levels after watching a Japanese comedy show than when they listened to a monotonous lecture. Keeping blood sugar levels in check is key to staving off diabetes-related complications such as kidney failure, blindness. Another Japanese study suggests that comedy might give Claritin a run for its money. Patients allergic to dust mites and other common irritants saw their skin welts temporarily shrink after watching Charlie Chaplin's comedies. A video of weather information had no effect whatsoever, it says. Turns out that being able to laugh at yourself or at least being able to see humor in difficult situations may help your ticker too, your heart. And at an American Heart Association meeting in November 2000, University of Maryland Medical Center cardiologist presented research suggesting that laughter may be a buffer against heart attacks. The researchers asked 300 people, half of whom had heart disease, a long list of what-if questions. What if they arrived at a party wearing exactly the same outfit as someone else there? Would they be able to laugh it off? If they're a guy, yes. If they're a girl, no. That's, that's easy. <laughs> what if the waiter spilled a drink on them at a meal out with friends? The investigators found that people with heart disease were 40% less likely to see the humor in life's everyday absurdities than were people the same age with healthy hearts. And there's more to that. We'll pick that up again next time. But... The Bible contained all of that, all of it. Thousands of years before science discovered it. Thousands of years before trained researchers finally figured it out. And yet the Bible says these men, these followers of the Lord that, that wrote your scriptures were untrained and ignorant men. They weren't learned in medicine, science, astronomy. They, they, they had no education. And if they did have education in those areas, like Moses, he was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, their medical uh, understanding was, was horrific. It wasn't just lacking, it was completely wrong. But he didn't write any of that in the Bible. So how do you account for the Bible being 100% accurate? There's only one way to account for it. God wrote it. 
And you can not only trust where it speaks scientifically, you can trust where it speaks about the heart of man. And it doesn't speak very highly about our heart. It says the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? It says we're a rebel. We're rebellious. We're lawbreakers. From the very beginning, the original sin of man wasn't murder, rape, or armed robbery. It was choosing to live independently of God, to go our own way. All we like sheep have gone gone astray, turned everyone to his own way. We've gone our own direction, done what we want to do. We've chosen our own path. The good news is that God desired to bring mankind, bring creation back to him. And sent his son to die on the cross of Calvary for you and you and you and you and you and me and everybody that's ever lived to pay our sin debt, to die on the cross. He, he had no sin debt to pay. He was the perfect son of God and God the son. But he died on the cross, shed his blood for you and for me. They buried him in a borrowed tomb, and three days later he arose triumphant over sin and over death. Forty days later he ascended up to heaven, but before he left he said, I'm coming back. And he is. When? We don't know. But he's coming back. As much as you can trust this book, you can trust what it says that Jesus said as well. He's coming back one day to take his own to be with him forever. If you want to be in that group, you have to be one of his own. You have to have your sins forgiven. If you choose to go your own way and continue down that path, the Bible says the wages of sin is death. Not just physical death. The first death, physical death, is the separation of our soul from our body. If I were to die right now, I wouldn't disappear. I'd just fall over. The security team would drag me out and they'd finish the service with somebody else. (laughs) That's it. Why? My soul has separated from my body. You know what spiritual death is? The separation of your soul from God forever. The Bible calls it the second death. First death is you just die physically. The second death, which you do not want to experience, is to be separated from God forever in a place called hell. Say, I don't want to go there. God doesn't want you to go there. That's why he died. That's why he paid such an enormous price. The Bible talks about this great contradiction of sinners against himself. He who knew no sin took your sin. You at your worst. In the middle of the night that you hope nobody ever finds out what you did, he took that. In the middle of the night where you would die of embarrassment if we were to show it on a screen, he saw it. But he took it. That's why in the Garden of Gethsemane, as you read in the Gospels, he says, oh God, if there's some other way, my Father, if, you could, if this cup could pass from me, nevertheless, not my will, but thine, O oh Lord. It wasn't that he didn't want to die. He'd already said, I came to die. I laid down my life. I laid down my life. I can take it again. It was the thought of the perfect God taking your sin and mine. You ever watch the news or read an article and you, you an article about somebody did something so atrocious that you just, ah. Oh. How could they do that? Now multiply that times billions. And he took all of that. And so as he struggles with the reality of becoming sin for us, he was willing to do that, that you might live with him forever. But if you choose to walk away from that, you've got no one to blame but yourself. Because he's made provision for you. He's made the way for you to have your sins forgiven, to live with him forever. You can trust this book. It tells us how we can know we can have everlasting life. It's not through a church. No. There's no church died for you. It's not through a priest. No priest died for you. It's not through the pope. It's not through some imam. It's not through some religious guru. It's not through some meditation speaker. It's not through a preacher. No, it's through the Lord Jesus Christ. But you must make that choice. You must make that decision. You can make it this morning. The Bible says you need to turn from your sin, be sorry for your sin, and by faith trust Christ and place your faith in him. You're not going to go to heaven by having your name on the church roll somewhere. You're not going to go to heaven because you joined some church. You're going to go to heaven when you come to the Lord Jesus Christ. Acknowledge what he already knows, that you're a sinner. You're a lawbreaker. You're a rebel. You've broken his laws. But he's willing to forgive you and adopt you into his family. That's your choice, your decision. Lord, I pray that you'd bless this invitation time now. I pray that you'd work in hearts and lives. In Jesus' name, amen. With heads bowed and eyes.